Banjo Kazooie. Let me tell you, it's about time someone talked about this hidden gem on the N64. Before they developed such classics like Kinect Sports Season 2 and Grab by the Ghoulies, Rareware actually made games for Nintendo, if you can believe it. All right, but in all seriousness, if you're between the ages of 25 to 34, you not only know what Banjo Kazooie is, but you probably consider it the greatest video game ever made. Or at least that's what John Tron in 2009 led me to believe. For those who grew up watching gaming YouTube during that era, it feels like almost everyone in the space had a hardcore passion for not only Banjo-Kazooie, but also the entire Rareware catalog. It was hard to escape the aesthetic influence Banjo-Kazooie had on gaming content at the time, and it was harder to watch a video on a 3D platform, or hell, maybe any game for that matter, that didn't reference back to this iconic gaming duo. It was the go-to comparison, making it a bit of the Dark Souls of its time in a sense. Everybody just loved the Baron Bird. Flash forward 12 years and discourse has changed. It's now about nations, ideologies, and ethnicity. It's, it's an endless series of proxy battles fought by simps and gay operatives. Discourse and its consumption of life has become a well-oiled Twitter argument. The point I'm trying to make is that I don't hear Banjo-Kazooie get brought up with anywhere near the reverence it once did. Hell, when Banjo is brought up nowadays, it's because of the character's inclusion in Smash, as well as when discussing the myriad of indie collectathon revivals that borrows its influence. Or steals it. Not that I don't blame people for forgetting about Banjo-Kazooie, after all, Microsoft has seemed pretty keen on doing just that, along with the rest of the treasure trove that is 90s Rareware IP. It's a well of creativity they're finally starting to tap into again with the announcement of a new Perfect Dark game in development. But as far as Banjo's concerned, he hasn't seen a game release since 2008. And we all know how that went. Coupled with the notion that, at least in retro game circles, the March of Time has not been too kind to the rest of Rareware's 3D platforming offerings on the N64. It's safe to say that most people recognize Donkey Kong 64 as an obese train wreck of a collectathon. Conker's Bad Fur Day is too busy getting pissed drunk and passing out and vomit behind the Denny's to try to actually be a good platformer. Even Banjo's sequel, Banjo Tooie, has been negatively criticized for having way too much everything. Hey, why the fuck this turn into Goldeneye? But Banjo-Kazooie has yet to suffer the same fate as its younger brothers, probably because it's fucking good. After replaying it on a whim for the first time in a while, I very quickly remembered just how tight, smart, and downright iconic the whole experience was. Is Banjo-Kazooie a forgotten classic? Absolutely not. These two chuckle fucks invitation to Smash was the highlight of E3 2019 for a ton of people, and I can't just disregard that. Clearly, there is a strong love for these characters and the IP as a whole. What I think everyone has forgotten about is just how amazing Banjo's first at bat really was, and that it's still one of the finest 3D platformers ever made. Now, if you want to play Banjo today, you have two options, the original N64 release or the HD version released on the Xbox Family Systems via XBLA or Rare Replay. This HD version is by far my personal favorite way to experience the game, as not only does it play in widescreen and up-res all the textures, it also subtly improves one of the core mechanics, which I'll talk about later. Although quick pro tip, if you're playing Banjo on a 360 specifically, make sure your console's output resolution is set to 720p. If you don't, the game will lag out constantly to the point of being actually unplayable. Oh shit, it's that Spiral Mountain jam. Enough with the boring crap. Let's get this fucking started. Not only is Spiral Mountain the first area of the game, it's easily its most iconic. I mean, it's the representing stage in Smash Bros for fuck's sake. However, what you might find really interesting if you've never played Banjo-Kazooie before is that Spiral Mountain only takes up around 10 to 15 minutes of playtime. You never go back to it for the rest of the game either. Seriously, even after resetting, the game starts you back at the front entrance of Grunty's Lair. It's not like there's a reason to backtrack there either. In fact, you're most likely to spend the least amount of time here out of any other level in the game. Okay, so why the fuck is this stage in Smash then? Well, for starters, the music, man. I know a few of you real ones out there started rolling your eyes once you heard this track start to play. Spyro Mountain's theme is the Aurorian dance of game review background music. Nobody will get this joke. I don't know, man. I ain't no Mozart. I ain't no Moat's hand either, for the record, but that kick-ass banjo adds a delightful jaunty whimsy to the whole adventure. It really gets you all hyped up and ready for the journey ahead. Spiral Mountain mainly acts as a tutorial to introduce new players to the basic movement mechanics of the game. Running, jumping, attacking, swimming, the whole 3D platformer shebang. However, the best tutorials are the ones you can skip. Yes, you can completely ignore this on your playthrough and just head straight to Grunty's Lair. While being ahead of its time in that regard, letting the prey stop there would be selling it short. You see, throughout Spiral Mountain are six honeycomb pieces, collectibles that, when obtaining six, give Banjo one extra unit of health. Spiral Mountain is the only area in the game with enough for a full unit of HP. In Spiral Mountain, the honeycomb pieces act as rewards for successfully executing the respective learned moves in a safe environment. However, on repeat playthroughs, players that choose not 
to go through the tutorial, we'll still actually do the tutorial anyways to collect the honeycomb pieces, both for the extra unit of health as well as 100% completion, which Banjo-Kazooie heavily encourages, a topic we'll put a pin in for now. But this is Banjo-Kazooie, it's not gonna have the tutorial be these ethereal out of nowhere text boxes that tell you how to push the X button, no god no. Instead Banjo-Kazooie introduces Bottles, a character that is the keeper of the game's manual's move list, and slowly doles out new abilities throughout the game. Because he's the main guide to the game, he's the character that both Banjo and Kazooie interact with the most. Kazooie and Bottles are usually found bickering amongst one another, whereas Banjo is just choosing to stay out of this shit. I think Bottles is a fun character, although I hate when he interrupts my game to inform me I've been awarded a gamer pick. This fourth wall breaking dialogue is a bit of a trait of 90s rareware, even as far back as Donkey Kong Country you'd have Cranky Kong acting like an arcade boomer about how games are fucking easy and how he can beat it in under an hour and all that. Fourth wall breaking humor is a tough act, as a worst case scenario will result in the media participant being taken out of the experience for no real payoff. Banjo's fourth wall breaks work because it's a cute game with talking animals and already doesn't take itself too seriously. He uses fourth wall breaks for tutorials and jokes, not to accuse me of war crimes, you feel what I'm saying? So whether or not you need a tutorial, you're going to see everything that Spiral Mountain has to offer. It's a pleasant, easy breezy starting level, and it sticks with you well after your short time spent there. But soon you'll enter the real hub world of the game, Gruntilda's Lair, which has an incredible atmosphere. The hub starts out pretty linear, but slowly branches out into multiple directions. It can come off as labyrinthian at times, but the areas are varied visually enough to help keep your bearings of where you generally are. The Grunty's Lair also has a wide variety of music variants that play throughout the hub, that not only fit the immediate region you're in, but also aid in helping you navigate. These visual and audio flares will also help cue you in on what the level theming will be for upcoming worlds, but for now we can't do much but collect our first jiggy. Before we head any further, it's important to explain the variety of collectibles found in Banjo-Kazooie, this being a collectathon and all. The two primary pickups are Jiggies, which are used in unlocking new worlds as well as the final boss, and Notes, which are used to open sealed doors that require an arbitrary amount of notes in order to pass. And this is where that big change from the N64 original to the HD version lies. In the N64 version, Rareware, probably coked out of their minds, decided it was a good idea to have a high note score system. For example, if you were to collect 64 notes in Mumbles Mountain and die or leave the stage, your total note score would be 64 for Mumbles Mountain. But if you go back to Mumbles Mountain because you need to raise your notes total, you'd find that all 100 notes have respawned into the level, meaning that you'd have to collect everything you just did plus the remaining notes. This inherently isn't a problem. The issue lies in the fact that the game is really fucking stingy with the minimum requirements to complete the game. So who's ready to do some math? To help prove this, let's use the minimum requirements to complete Super Mario 64 as a comparison. In order to gain access to Bowser in the Sky and roll credits, you need a minimum of 70 Power Stars to beat the game without glitches. With 120 total power stars in the game, that makes it so players have to obtain a little over 58% completion in order to finish the game. In Banjo-Kazooie, you need a minimum, a MINIMUM of 94 jiggies and 810 notes. Now, there are only 100 jiggies and 900 notes in the game, meaning that a player would need to complete over 90% of the game's content just to see the final boss. Because of this, it's just recommended that you 100% the game every time you play. Now, because the game subtly forces you to to obtain 100 notes in every stage, it's bullshit that the game makes you get all the notes in one go. It makes it so a death could snap away 10 to 30 minutes of stage progress depending on how far you were. The HD version decides to make it so once a note is collected, it is permanently added to Banjo's total, and if you die or leave the stage, notes don't reset. You could simply say this makes the game too easy, but I think it simply makes the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay significantly less stressful. Now, where Spiral Mountain does an excellent job in teaching the basic controls and movement, Mumbo's Mountain is about teaching you how to explore the worlds found in Banjo-Kazooie. I know a lot of people like to compare Banjo-Kazooie to Super Mario 64, hell I fucking just did. After all, they are THE defining N64 3D platformers, but as actual games go, they aren't really comparable in too many meaningful ways. Whereas Mario 64 has a focus on energetic, flexible platforming in a 3D space, Banjo decides to slow down and simplify movement, which allows players to take levels at their own pace, as well as let them explore and jump around with relative ease. The level design of Mumbles Mountain is consistent with this philosophy. The area from a top-down perspective is one big circle, with the right side of the map being elevated via a big slope that splits the level basically in half. Because of all the slopes, the chances of anyone taking major fall damage in this stage is near zero, giving a lot of wiggle room when it comes to platforming. Mumbles Mountain also does a great job at showing the player the a variety of ways jiggies can be attained. Some jiggies are just laying out in the open, but some, like the jiggy from the totem pole and the one hidden in the hut, require new abilities to be used. 
Congo's area requires you to complete a simple puzzle to obtain a Jiggy, as well as trade a level specific collectible for a Jiggy with the chimp. Now, I can understand how some might see this as a silly thing to bring up in a review. Like, yeah, no shit, dude. But I think people, myself included, who play a lot of video games tend to take this really basic stuff for granted when it comes to game design. Gamer intuition is real, for as stupid as it sounds, and we can assume a lot about how a game works based on our experiences with other games, even if your brain is doing this on a subconscious level. For the people that aren't as game savvy, they can still pick up a controller and start Banjo-Kazooie with relative ease, in a way that doesn't negatively impact or at all affect experienced players. I'd say a majority of the fans of Banjo-Kazooie today are people that played it when they were growing up as kids, myself included, and part of the reason the nostalgia is there is because it's a very easy game to groove with, which I honestly can't say about most contemporary releases. Banjo-Kazooie has truly phenomenal level design in every single one of its stages, with Mumbles Mountain being no exception. The secret to Banjo-Kazooie's memorable locales are their landmark level design. Each of Banjo-Kazooie's levels can be broken down to little sites of attraction that help you keep your bearings even if you get turned around. Take a look at a top-down simplified map of Mumbles Mountain. You can see we have the bridge over the pond, the area with the unkillable bull, Congo's tree, the two cliff sides, the Stonehenge area near the Talon Trot power-up, the Termite Hill, the Totem Pole, and Mumbles Hut. That right there covers nearly the entire map, split up by immediately identifiable locations. All other levels do this too, even Gruntilda's Lair to an extent. This type of level design works wonders in helping prevent one of the worst blights that could occur when playing a collect-a-thon game, thinking you've finished a level only to be missing like two precursor orbs or whatever. If you're deliberate and thorough combing each landmark for collectibles in Magic Kazooie, you'll not have to worry about being a few notes short. But that's Mumbles Mountain from a top-down perspective. When actually playing it, the way the level is designed acts as a subtle, invisible hand guiding the player. Right when you start the stage, Banjo can't ascend steep cliffs, so the right side of the stage is completely off limits. While crossing the bridge, you are going to see a small little guy waving at you. He's a Jinjo, and if you collect all five in a stage, you receive a Jiggy. The Jinjos stand out because they are the only collectible in the game that has an auditory clue of them whistling, yelping, and yelling for help. Because of this, Jinjos tend to be hidden or more obscured from view than Nose and Jiggies are. There's five in every level, and they are very fun to collect, if anything, for their insane pop-off. Later in the level, you actually come across the man of the mountain, Mumbo Jumbo. Mumbo is a shaman character who can transform Banjo into a wide variety of level-specific creatures by trading in Mumbo tokens, yet another collectible. I think it's interesting to note that of all the collectibles needed for completion, Mumbo tokens are the most lenient one, only requiring 75 when there are over 110 spread throughout the game. They remind me of the philosophy behind the Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild, where the point isn't to collect all 900, but instead just to have an overabundance so players are bound to find it at least some, regardless of where they are. Because of this, Mumbo tokens are not tallied anywhere for 100% completion, and once you reach that 75 total, you no longer need to worry about them. As for the mountain transformation, Banjo turns into a termite, which lets him ascend the rest of the termite hill from earlier in the level. The termite mainly serves as a suited tutorial to introduce transformations and how they work, so Rareware keeps the termite deliberately simple. Because of that, it's worth holding my full thoughts on the transformations themselves until a bit later when more are introduced. But enough about level design for right now. The Baron Bird's moveset really does doesn't start coming together until you pick up three moves from bottles in Mumbles Mountain. The Talon Trot is the most immediately satisfying ability to use because it greatly improves your overall mobility. Not only is Kazooie not really affected by slopes, jumping from a Talon Trot is higher and has way more mid mobility than what Banjo can do, with the downside of not being able to double jump. It's a good way to balance the Talon Trot. Near Congo's area, Kazooie will unlock the ability to shoot eggs out from either hole if you catch my drift. The blue eggs are the Gorilla Glue of Banjo Kazooie. If you need to interact with something, chances are it's going to require blue eggs. The blue eggs can also be shot out as a projectile that deals damage to enemies. However, this is very rarely worth doing, because the eggs themselves do little damage, and it takes quite a few to defeat an enemy. Because the blue eggs are such a frequently used item for level progression, it's best just to hoard your eggs for these moments. Although, I won't go as far to say Banjo Kazooie makes you think at all about resource management, because throughout my entire playthrough I never came anywhere near close to running out of blue eggs. The rest of Banjo Kazooie's available moves are pretty standard platforming fare, like a double jump, a ground pound, which is the last move obtained in Mumbles Mountain and a backflip that gives you the most height at the cost of taking a second to perform. The game also decides to slowly build out the rest of the move list by having you seek out at least one new ability in the first six worlds. What's interesting though is that the moves that are unlocked after this point are abilities that require a context sensitive item to use or have a situational use case. What I'm trying to say is that no moves added after World 1 feel integral to playing Banjo Kazooie from a moment to moment gameplay perspective. It's worth pointing out because this tends to be a pitfall most games fall into that slowly introduce new mechanics and abilities over the course of the game. Take a look at Cyber Shadow for instance, a game I conveniently reviewed on Turnstile. Hit the card if you want to watch that. 
Anyways, that's a game that looks and plays radically differently at the end as opposed to when you begin. While that slow buildup of abilities works wonders on the first run, on repeat playthroughs the game becomes a bit of a more of a slog, because I, the experienced player, don't have access to the full ability suite until two thirds of the way through the game. Because Banjo doles out all the frequently used abilities in the first 30 minutes, players never feel gimped or limited no matter how many times they replay it. Overall, Mumbles Mountain is a pretty excellent starting level. It deliberately keeps the enemies, exploration, and level layout pretty Pretty simple to ease people into the game. It's not the best level in the game, nor is it trying to be. Because that's what the next level is! It's time for what's probably my favorite stage in the game, Treasure Trove Cove, as I'm such a sucker for a great beach aesthetic. It's got it all. Clear skies, golden grains of sand, and of course that beautiful ocean what hey, do you guys hear something? Oh. Snacker is great, and his omnipresence on the map leads players to explore the cove in a very specific way. It's a water level where the goal is to stay out of the water as much as possible. This concept is even fortified by the introduction of these water mine enemies, who, while not as dangerous or panic inducing as Snacker, still give you that unease when entering the few pools of water that Snacker can't nip you in. Unlike later areas that feature hazards that deal damage on contact, falling into water in Treasure Trove Cove isn't the end of the world, and you can still avoid Snacker with a little bit of maneuvering. It's a nice step to increase the general difficulty of exploration without going from 0 to 100. Treasure Trove Cove is also where you get the best ability in the game. It's so cool that they let you fucking fly so early on in the adventure. Like, maybe I'm alone in this, but I feel that many times games save their especially cool power-ups or abilities until past the midway point so as to not overwhelm the player. The power to fly is a dream I know many people have, and games that do allow for full freedom of flight in open environments can provide a sense of wonderment just on its own. But what propels that first takeoff in Banjo-Kazooie to a euphoric gaming moment TM is how the level has played out before you start flying. Like, right when you start the level, you get Snacker's Rude Awakening, and platforming around anywhere close to water starts getting pretty tense. After all, you don't want to fall in, you don't want to take damage, but most of all, you don't want to hear that damn music. But then you get the ability to take off from the mast of the pirate ship and huzzah! I'm so far away from danger! Snacker can't hurt me anymore! Life is fucking great! The introduction of flight in Banjo-Kazooie also allows the levels to be much more vertically oriented than you would find in your standard 3D platformer. Treasure Trove Cove is as tall as it is sprawling, making a small explorable area on paper feel huge when you're actually playing it. This sprawling level design actually allows Treasure Trove Cove to make full use of its beach aesthetic all while implementing landmark level design. You meet this giant enemy hermit crab named Nipper, who, after taking a few pecks to the eyes, lets you enter inside a shell. And it's the most atmospheric little section of the game! All the music instruments drop out except for the xylophone, and all you can hear is that and the dripping of water. It's such a great soundscape, and it's all for a sub area you're not going to be in for longer than 45 seconds. Let's actually take a sec and address the music of Banjo-Kazooie on the whole. The well-known composer of Banjo is Grant Kirkhope, a man who's been composing game music for nearly 25 years. He served as Rareware's primary go-to composer both during their 90s golden era as well as in the years following the Microsoft acquisition. Despite the countless number of games and movies he's worked on, Banjo-Kazooie remains his magnum opus. The game's OST is simply a masterful piece of work. Each main level theme in the game has a multitude of variants in tempo and instrumentation that allows the music to always fit the exact mood on screen, like how the Treasure Trove Cove theme shifts to its sea shanty rendition as you approach the pirate ship. The amount of variance on the main theme of Banjo-Kazooie in particular is absolute insanity, but obviously this wouldn't be nearly as effective without the tunes themselves being both extremely memorable and catchy. Hell, half the time I don't even catch that I'm hearing the main theme. It's not surprising to me though that Rareware really cared and put a lot of effort into their audio, as Banjo-Kazooie is a game that's musically inclined even when playing on mute. The main collectibles of the game are literal music notes. The game's opening cutscene is of the cast performing a medley, and even the main characters are named after instruments. But music only makes up a, but a portion of the total audio found in almost any game. Though thankfully Kirkhope and Rareware knocked it out of the park with their Foley in voiceover too. The art of sound effects goes underappreciated in game reviews I find, which is a shame because they are so important to achieving the coveted praise of good game feel. All of the pickup sound effects are immensely satisfying. I especially love the sound effect that plays when you pick up a feather for the first time. It's so relaxing.
But back on the beach though, there is so much more to do. You can enter this sand castle that also acts as the area where you can enter any cheat codes for the game, both canonical and of the Scholastic Book Fair kind. There's this huge pirate ship that is this hippo character named Captain Blubber and he looks so sad. You have to help him find his treasure by going under the ship. Oh, and there's this great little moment where you have to fly around the whole map participating in an X marks the spot treasure hunt that ends in a jiggy. Not only are these activities varied from a gameplay perspective, but they all mesh wonderfully with the level theming of a beach cove. Although probably my favorite part of the whole stage is its peak, the lighthouse. While most players will probably enter this area of the map through the entrance lower in the level, the top part of the area is fully rendered in with the rest of the level, meaning that you could just fly all the way up there if you really wanted to. To give you that sense that you are up high in the sky, the level music becomes distant and hard to hear, and you start to hear this waning siren. It's vertigo inducing, especially when nabbing some collectibles near the edge. Oh, and you can also break Banjo's legs. Uh -oh. Okay, now I think we've started to have a bit too much fun, so now we get to play Clanker's Cavern. Clanker's Cavern isn't necessarily bad, it's just Banjo's equivalent to Marble Zone from Sonic 1. It really takes the wind out of your sails when you get there, both from an aesthetic and gameplay perspective. After all, we did just go from a really sunny mountainside in Island Cove to a fucking sewer, and unlike Treasure Trove Cove, you'd rather be inside the shark than anywhere else. Clanker's Cavern is where we see Banjo-Kazooie introduce its other form of level design, which I will refer to as centerpiece level design. What separates centerpiece level design from landmark level design in the prior stages is that the centerpiece levels feature primarily one big landmark in the center of the level that can be interacted with in a variety of ways. For example, let's take a look at all the different ways you interact with Clanker throughout the stage. First, as soon as you meet up with him, you're prompted to swim below him and raise him up to the water level. Once you do that, you'll be able to hop around both on and around him. You can climb up on his tail to reach the section of the level you couldn't before, as well as ride his blowhole cover to the highest point in the stage. Entering Clanker is also very interactable too. There are five different entrances inside of Clanker. You can enter through the aforementioned blowhole, you can shoot out at his gold teeth with eggs, and you can even swim right between his gills too. Too. As for what's inside Clanker, mainly it's just a minigame room along with a side area that houses the Wonder Wing ability. The Wonder Wing consumes the rare gold feather collectibles, but in return grants Banjo complete invincibility at the push of a button. Despite getting access to this ability so early on in the adventure, the actual amount of times one will go about using this ability is pretty limited. I think this is because of the low count of gold feathers you have in your inventory at any one time. Rareware can't design a lot of Wonder Wing required areas because the players are likely to be low or out of gold feathers most of the time. So because of that, they act like more of a real tool in the arsenal than just a lock and key like the eggs do. Now, you're probably asking at this point, well, Sam, what gives? I thought you didn't like this level. You seem pretty positive on it. And you'd be right. I actually really like Clanker proper. It's the cavern itself that sucks. When I talk about the levels in Banjo-Kazooie that feature centerpiece level design, in reality, most of these stages are hybrids of sorts, where, yeah, there's a prominent centerpiece to the level, but there are still other smaller landmarks that help fill in the whole stage. Clanker's cavern is the only centerpiece level in the game that doesn't try to add any more to the stage aside from Clanker himself. So the rest of the level consists of nothing but platforming on metal grates, climbing up poles, and swimming through pipes. Now, I gotta be honest, I never really agreed with the extreme hate that many people have for water levels in games. While I can appreciate the criticism that most water levels forego the respective game's on-land mechanics in order to make an underwater level work, I more so see water levels as just an extension of a character's overall abilities, and when done right, they can serve as a nice reprieve from regular gameplay. Swimming from from Banjo-Kazooie is fine overall. You have two swim speeds, Kazooie for taking big strokes that dash you forward whichever way you're facing, and Banjo's much slower kicking to help with positioning. I don't know if this was also in the original version, but on the HD version you can press the left and right bumpers to help quick turn Banjo in a respective direction while swimming or flying. Once figuring this out, it really helped make swimming hassle-free. Again, Clanker's Cavern isn't a bad level, I just think it's significantly less interesting to compare to where we've been and where we're heading next. Bubble Gloop Swamp, on the other hand, is a much better stage. This is the first world of the game that has a hazardous floor tile with the piranha infested swamp water. Now the game is finally starting to directly punish poor platforming and movement. I also think this is the main reason for the introduction of the Wonder Wing in the last level. In Bubble Gloop Swamp and the following couple stages, there are huge swaths of a level that is nothing but hurt on contact floor hazards. If a player were to fall and land in the middle of one of these areas, they could easily lose multiple units of HP, if not die outright. By having access to the Wonder Wing, you can trade your gold feathers resource 
resources in order to protect some of your HP as you race back to land. But thankfully, you shouldn't have to do that that often because of this level's new move, the Waiting Boots. The boots are kind of... Eh. Unlike temporary power-ups typically found in these kinds of platforming games, the Waiting Boots length of use is based on where you use them. The reason for this is so they can be used with a wide variety of obstacles to cross. The issue lies in the fact that most people on their first or second playthroughs are not going to know exactly where they need to go or if they can even get to where they want to go in the first place when they grab a pair of waiting boots. Oh, and it's also a little bitchy to hide the move right behind the starting point in the level. At least they have this frog enemy hopping around in the corner to guide your eye. Speaking of the enemies for a second, in most instances the baddies of Banjo are a little to no threat. Because each enemy will drop at least one honeycomb piece on death, it's really only an issue when an enemy gets two or more hits on you. But dude, this jiggy where you have to defeat the golden frogs can kiss my ass. I don't know if it's my depth perception being messed with or what, but I just could not for the life of me hit these damn frogs. Bubblegoop Swamp is another one of those stages that feels bigger than it is on paper. The map itself is pretty compact, but there's so much to do. This stage also features a really cool area once you reach the center point of the stage. From here, the path splits off into three main ways, and immediately to your left is a giant crocodile, and immediately to your right is a giant turtle. These two big animals are so visually striking, they genuinely make the whole level work for me. Like, they're where I got the idea for the landmark level design theory, with how they beautifully act as your compass in this very seeming looking dark green swamp. I don't like this maze though. If you want to get to Mumbo's hut, you have to use the waiting boots to run through the maze. You have to equip like four pairs of waiting boots to get through, and it takes nearly a minute to do. Which is fine, I guess, but between the simple but tricky jiggy about 80% through, as well as the challenging transformation mini game, you'll probably have to run through this maze at least a couple times in your first playthrough. Also home in this stage is the crocodile transformation and the second one in the game. The best equivalent I can make to the transformations in Manjo are like the captures of Mario Odyssey. They're cute and novel when you get a new one, but four out of five transformations in the game only do one thing, and their main purpose is to just serve to be a lock and key for Jiggies, Gingers, and Notes, which isn't necessarily a problem from a general point of view. The transformations work as nice breaks from regular platforming and to reapproach levels in a different way. I just wish their transformations had more abilities to use. But I bring the croc up specifically because we have to play another mini game. Let's go. This fucker right here is Mr. Vial and he can eat my nuts. You have to go through three 60 second rounds of eating these big eyed vegetables. However, Mr. Vial's base speed is slightly faster than Banjo's unless you're biting, which gives you a small boost forward. The matches are all down to the wire cage matches of intensity. And anytime you lose, Mr. Vial bites off two bars of HP. Even if you tie, which with how the rubber banding AI works is a very common occurrence, it's treated the exact same way as a loss. The worst part is, is that if you leave to get more health and come back, you have to start from round one again. This, in my opinion, is the single hardest and most annoying jiggy to get in the entire game. I don't really know how to end this section of the video, so I'll just say I really like the sound effect. Freeze Easy Peak is the next level up, and it's another highlight of the game for me. Now, I'm from Chicago, and it's fucking cold half the year here. It sucks and I hate it. So take it from me that even the winter wonderland of Freeze Easy Peak melts my frozen heart. It may just be the most joyous winter-themed wonderland in all of video games. It's got all the Christmas staples, putting lights on the Christmas tree, handing out presents to children, kamikaze bombing the locals, assaulting drunk people. Yeah, the beak bomb's a pretty flashy move. Also also pretty fucking hysterical too. Look what happens when you miss. Uh -oh. <laughs> It takes a bit of practice to get your aim consistent, but it's definitely one of the most satisfying attacks in the game. Freeze Easy Peak is another stage that takes full advantage of Banjo-Kazooie's insane verticality. It's the second level of the game to use the centerpiece level design that was first introduced in Clanker's Cavern, where there's an explorable major landmark set in the middle of the level, with jiggies and notes being spread in the surrounding perimeter. However, what makes Freeze Easy's level design better than Clanker's is that the big snowman doesn't do all the heavy lifting. You still have the igloo with the young cubs crying, the big Christmas tree in the corner, the miniature cabins reminiscent of a Christmas village, that, and so on. And I especially love that whole, I don't know what you'd call it, side quest, I guess, with lighting up the Christmas tree. First, you gotta get these lights on the tree by playing this mini game where these cute little twinklies get eaten in a million pieces in a blink of an eye. It's a funny juxtaposition compared to the really lighthearted music that plays during this mini game. After rescuing the twinklies, you then have to light up the star at the top of the tree and then fly through it three times before it shuts off to unlock the jiggy inside the tree. And then the music fully changes to feature sleigh bells prominently in the mix to fill you with Christmas cheer. This is so fucking good. Actually, this level does an especially good job at guiding players. It pushes you around the 
stage in a clockwise direction before having you ascend the snowman. After doing everything there is to do on top of the snowman, Banjo yeets himself out of there in one of the few in-level cutscenes in the game, which drops you right off near the start, letting you knock out most of the collectibles in one big loop. Although you'll notice how I said most of the collectibles, as it's worth noting that this stage is the only time in the game that 100% completion is not possible in one go. After beating Boggy in a sled race as the Walrus transformation, you can challenge him again as Banjo proper, but you won't have access to the required final move of the game, the Speed Shoes. I find this particularly weird, as it seems very deliberate that the devs wanted to push players to complete the stages in one big go, especially considering how the N64 version tallies notes. It's not the end of the world or anything, it just stands out as the lone exception to the rule, and you also need the Speed Shoes to obtain Grunty's Lair's Freeze Easy Jiggy, so you would have had to come back to the entrance to the world anyways. Gobi's Valley's up next, and can I just say for a second that it's so fucking nice that we are a little under two thirds of the way through the game, and we're just now getting a desert level? You know how fucking sick I am of seeing World 2 deserts in video games? Please make it stop! We also get one of the best lines of dialogue in the whole game. See, even Banjo's not having it today. Banjo-Kazooie has really great character interactions. Even as far back as the original Donkey Kong Country, Rarers seem to have an amazing knack to create memorable characters, like Diddy Kong, Cranky Kong, and fan-favorite Funky Kong. But in the country games, interactions were only held between a small handful of characters, and since the playable Kongs were silent, these conversations only went one way. With Banjo-Kazooie, we really get to see Rareware fully flesh out their character writing chops to big effect. Kazooie's a bit of a firebrand that tries to start shit with everyone, where Banjo acts as the more lethargic dumbass of the duo. The setting of Grunty's Lair also allows the villain of the story to consistently come on the PA system in between levels to chastise the player all in rhyme. The whole cast, including the one-off characters, are extremely charming, and they all do a good job of standing out. This is helped by the fact that nearly everything in the game is sentient. Yeah, the jiggies, feather, hell, the fucking toilet. Everything talks to you at least once, yet it never feels like the dialogue gets in the way of gameplay, which I can't say about many other 3D platformers. Gobi's Valley is a level where the primary focus is less on straight exploration, and instead on completing small minigames or tasks, which are found in the handful of pyramids spread throughout the stage. Beat the maze, fly through the rings, shit in the bowl, complete the matching board, etc. The act of going from pyramid to pyramid, though, is the real meat and potatoes of the level, and it's good eaten. In this level, you unlock the last move of the game, the speed shoes, which act as the inverse of the waiting boots, letting you trot around much faster for a short period of time. The game mainly uses this ability for time trial movement-based challenges, which I gotta say are particularly fucking tight. Like this race up the pyramid damn near requires you to make these really close cuts across the track in order to enter the top before it closes. Also, it doesn't help that you're forced to blow five seconds seconds in the clock to watch this cutscene of the gate open every time you make an attempt. Despite all of Gobi's Valley's pyramids having the same color and general shape, each of them have their own small differences to help you determine which specific one you're at. And it's shit like that that should be highly commended. It's not easy to develop and create playable spaces that stick in your brain like a parasite. Like look at Cyberpunk 2077's Night City, which yeah, weird fucking comparison I know, but fuck it, the wound's still recent and I'm a salty salty boy about it. Yeah, the game has been throwing a lot of shit for the bugs and weak RPG systems, and rightfully so, but I still see too many people giving the game praise because the city, bro. Yeah, the open world is hundreds if not thousands of times bigger than Gobi's Valley, yet can you fucking tell me where the fuck I am right now in Night City? No, you can't, because this game's glorified empty space. It's nothing but a network of waypoints and objective markers. And this is why open world game design is such a fucking travesty. Like, you watch these E3 demos and all the devs can talk about is how living and breathing their big ass open world game is. But the only thing breathing in this situation is me. And those breaths are being fucking wasted as I drive to the 25th fucking waypoint. Gotta f Where was I again? Whatever. So, Man Monster Mansion is where we finally see Banjo-Kazooie pick up a bit more in terms of difficulty, but unlike the later stages that feature more treacherous hazards or perilous platforming, the difficulty bump in Mad Monster Mansion stems from the act of exploring. The level feels like a scavenger hunt, with the 100 notes littered in every area of the map, with only small handfuls doled out at a time. You need to really keep good track on where you've already explored. It really requires you to fully explore every orifice both inside and out of the mansion. The mansion itself is one of my favorite areas of the whole game. All the different rooms you're able to enter make it one of the most fleshed out areas in the whole adventure. There are over half a dozen rooms that would make up the interior of a real mansion. Hell, you even go down the gutter once you unlock the pumpkin transformation. Some of the rooms don't even have important collectibles in them. They're just there to explore because fuck it, going around this mansion's fun as hell. Aesthetically, Mad Monster Mansion is to Halloween as Freeze Easy Peak is to Christmas. While I've never been a particularly big horror fan myself, I've always loved a good spooky setting and yes, there is a difference. The level packs in so many spooky staples like the hedge mage, the haunted mansion, and a graveyard with some asshole plants. 
Yeah, fuck you too, buddy. I also love this Alice in Wonderland style church with my main squeeze moat's hand. So this is where Master Anne was chilling before Smash. And what would be a spooky monster level without some ghost enemies? While there have been unkillable enemies introduced in levels prior, they have been highly limited in where they can appear and attack you, such as Snacker or the Bull. Mad Monster Mansion's ghosts can be found in many different sections of the map. Thankfully, you can actually kill them by using your Wonder Wing move. The ghosts in Mad Monster Mansion are finally a chance for the Wonder Wing to be a useful tool in the arsenal, and the ghosts can still be avoided pretty easily even without gold feathers, so you won't be SOL if you used up all your resources. Overall, Mad Monster Mansion is another really great level, and I know it's spooky theme makes it a lot of people's favorite stage of the game. Now, at this point, let's take a quick breather from the level by level analysis, and let me address something that I think is important to bring up. You see, up until this point, all my praise for the game, while they are my opinions taken from my most recent playthroughs as an adult, are most definitely rose tinted. I played this game all the time in 8th and 9th grade, exploring the levels while talking to some old internet friends on Skype. Hell, I'd even hook up my Dazzle DVC 100 in screen share so they can help me locate the last notes I need. But my nostalgic memory really only goes up to Mad Monster Mansion, and drops off considerably after that. And while I did manage to beat Banjo on original N64 hardware when I was 14 or 15 years old, I don't have the same connection with the last set of the game that I do with what we've covered up to this point. Just wanting to keep it honest, let's get back to it. The reason for that drop off in nostalgia is mainly because of the eighth level, Rusty Bucket Bay. I fucking hated this place as a kid, and if you've played Banjo before, I think you do too. Although, playing through it again as not only an adult, but also someone a lot better at video games, I got through it with really no issues. Rusty Bucket Bay is more or less Clanker's Cavern 2.0. It's another centerpiece focused water level, with you instead mainly exploring a freighter boat instead of a giant metal shark. However, this stage is superior to Clanker's Cavern in two major ways. The first is that the centerpiece of this level, a giant freighter boat, is the most explorable area of the whole game. The amount of side areas on this boat that are obvious, obscured, and downright hidden are too many to count, and that's something I gotta complain about. So all the major centerpiece levels like Clanker's Cavern and Mad Monster Mansion have multiple entrances and exits out of the centerpiece. However, it's been easy to infer exactly what you're able to be interacting with up to this point. In Clanker's Cavern, Clanker mentions his teeth after raising him, and even if you miss that speech bubble, both teeth are gold and stand out, especially with the platform placed where they are in the water. In Mad Monster Mansion, the side windows are able to be broken if the light in the room is on. Again, very clear visually. However, on the good old rusty bucket, in order to access some side rooms that have key notes and jiggies you need to collect, require you to break these circular windows, but you can't tell at all what is breakable and what isn't. So this basically means you have to go around the ship like two times to check and double check all the windows, and that's lame. But the second improvement over Clanker's Cavern is that there are interesting elements to the perimeter of the level too, like the toll rays that require eggs to open, or the small pit of toxic waste. Oh, and Snacker's back. <laughs> Rusty Bucket really ups the ante with swimming too. Due to the water being heavily mixed with oil, Banjo's breath meter drains twice as fast. Not only that, but coming to the top of the water doesn't refill your air. You need to be fully removed from the water for a couple seconds before Banjo will fully be able to take a breath. Because of this, it's important to only go into the water when you need to enter a side area or grab certain pickups. This makes the level a bit more reminiscent of Treasure Trove Cove, where the goal was to stay out of the water as much as possible in that sense. There are a shocking amount of firsts featured in this eighth level of the game. For one, Rusty Rusty Bucket Bay is the only stage in the entire game to have a straight up bottomless pit. This was the particular area I really struggled with growing up, but honestly this playthrough I got through it with no problems, no deaths, and had plenty of time to spare on collecting this jiggy. But in the N64 original, it was a very nerve wracking sub area that could easily kill your note score because there are about a dozen notes found in the belly of the ship. Rusty Bucket Bay also houses the only level boss in the game, Boss Boombox. Okay, maybe one of you is counting Nipper, but I don't. The fight is just like attacking normal enemies, except he splits in two every couple hits. It's clear that Banjo-Kazooie has the type of gameplay that doesn't fully gel with what makes for a great boss battle, so where were ops to keep these kinds of enemy encounters to a minimum throughout the whole game? Would I call it the worst level in the game? No, in fact I don't think any of the game's 9 levels stand out as a step below the rest, but Rusty Bucket Bay is definitely the most unpleasant to play through, although that unpleasantness stems from the level's grungy ass aesthetic and tough hazards like the pit in oil water. But we're done with that now, thankfully. The last level of the game is Click Clock Wood, although you wouldn't think that from an initial glance. In fact, I wouldn't blame you if you have thought this was the very first level of the game if you haven't played before. Very few games decide to wrap up and have a big finale in a forest world. Hell, this even subverts what Rareware tends to do with the Donkey Kong games, where the levels start as natural forest, caves, and treetops before devolving into polluted industrial factories. Click Clock Wood is probably my second favorite stage in the game because its level focus is a big tree. Do any of you guys have these weird little things you just love in your media. For me, it's the big tree. I just love bullshit that features a big tree. 
The reason I love Big Tree from a conceptual level is that in this one giant life form, there exists a whole ecosystem of animals and plants that thrive in and around it. And part of what makes Click Clock Wood so amazing is that it actually exemplifies that in the level design. Throughout the area and up and around the tree, you'll find a cast of cute critters that live there. Naughty from Donkey Kong Country makes a cameo appearance, there's Nabnut the Squirrel, there's the Zubbas, a group of bees who live in the beehive halfway up the tree, and Eerie who is a cute baby eagle. They all live in this environment and it's the level where the game truly feels the most alive. But I wouldn't mention all the characters if you only saw them once, as the entire gimmick of Click Clock Wood revolves around the four seasons. The level starts in a hub area where the spring switch is located, that opens up to the spring area and located somewhere in the spring area is a switch to the summer area, and so on. The seasons also reflect the passage of time. For example, this area in spring features barely started treehouse, but in winter it's all finished and you're fully able to walk around in it. What I love about the season gimmick is that you experience life with these creatures. With Naughty, you need to wait until summer in order to break the rock blocking his home, but in order to enter his dam for the Jiggy, you need to wait for the water to come back and fall. Then you got Nabnut, who, when you meet in summer, is having a mukbang and clearly has no chill. So when you see him again in fall, he's too fucking fat to move Sonic 2 XL style, so you have to collect the last few acorns for him so he can hibernate. And when you enter his hut in winter, he's totally passed out. You can first visit the Subas in spring as the bee transformation, but you won't be able to get the Jiggy they're guarding until summer. And if you go back to the hive in the fall, the last remaining Zubba will tell you that since you took the Jiggy, they have no reason to stay at the hive, and when you drop by in the winter, the hive is completely destroyed and abandoned. Eerie the Eagle, who you wake up in the spring, needs to be fed worms in order to grow to an adult and give you a Jiggy. And he requires 15 caterpillars, which is the highest requirement for any level-specific collectible by a long shot. Even Gobi comes back from Gobi's Valley to get his hump humped one more time. Click Clock Wood really does test all of the Banjo-Kazooie skills it's been having you build up throughout the game. Now you have to thoroughly explore a level four separate times, because each season has its own quirks and changes, as well as all new different placements for the 100 notes. It also features the most hazardous platforming yet, as Click Clock Wood is the king of vertically oriented stages in the game. While the later seasons have access to flight pads, allowing you to descend the tree with ease, in most instances you'll have to climb the tree legit, and falling off will seriously fuck you up. Click Clock Wood is also home to the last transformation in the game, the B. And while this is the one of the five that has, like, an actual mechanic, it kinda sucks. And that's fucked up, because this clearly shouldn't. Being able to become a bee and fly around this nice big tree should be fucking fun. But the FOV is so up Banjo's ass, I can't see anything. I think the reason it plays like this is because the bee's flight is just the equivalent of using a flight pad with infinite red feathers, which I can understand why they did that. Designing and implementing new flight controls would take a lot of dev time, which I'm sure wasn't the most economical design decision. The issue lies in the fact that the bee just takes so much screen real estate compared to Kazooie in flight. It's significantly easier to see where you're flying with her. But the most frustrating part is that they didn't implement the ability to cancel flight at all with the bee. While Kazooie's flight doesn't have a stop button necessarily, you can cancel flight into a beak buster which acts as your brake. But the bee can't do that, so if you want to land in the ground you have to dive straight into the floor and it just feels gross. The last kick in the balls is that you can only use the bee in the spring area, which yeah it makes sense you know bees jacking it in flowers and all, but it just really limits what you can actually do while flying around. Also, the music in this stage is insane. Not only is the base level theme extremely catchy and all the seasonal versions are aesthetically fitting, but that's not all. This single level features, I am not shitting you, 20 different music tracks that play throughout the four seasons. Grant Kirkhope, the fucking mad lad. All right, here's some other nonsense the game's throwing at me last minute. All right, so remember those honeycomb pieces from the tutorial? Yeah, they raise your total HP pool. Banjo starts with five units, though really six including the pieces from Spiral Mountain. Each of the nine levels up to this point feature two honeycomb pieces, getting Banjo's max life up to seven in Clanker's Cavern and eight in Gobi's Valley. But after collecting the six piece in Click Clock Wood, I still have eight units of health. What the actual fuck? What other game is out there where you collect the heart pieces and it just says, Good for you, now fuck off. Like, was it really that hard to just give Banjo the extra unit of HP? Come on. Okay, hold on, crackpot theory time about some shit that does not matter. So, what I think happened is that the only honeycomb collectibles in the game initially were found in the nine levels, and there were no pieces to collect in Spiral Mountain. Late in development, Rareware probably added the six pieces to Spiral Mountain for the game design reasons we discussed earlier in the review. But when doing that, they probably didn't think to give Banjo the extra ninth unit of health he need to be able to have. Regardless, it's just a strange oversight in a very polished game. We finally arrived at the end of the game, with all jiggies and notes in hand, but before we can fight the final boss, we have to go through something a little different. 
Grunty's Furnace Funhouse is a triumph, straight up. On one hand, it sucks I have to take a test at the end of the game like I'm in school, but on the other hand, it's a testament to just how memorable this entire game is, that this kind of trivia is even possible at all for a first time player to go through. Like, just imagine for a second, the end of Uncharted 4 at Thief's End. Fucking Rafe Adler or whatever makes Nathan Drake answer trivia questions about his past adventures. And he's all like, yo Drake, can you name this character? Like you see how fucking insane this would be? But the trivia for the most part is genuinely fun and varied. Skimming through the wiki, there seems to be well over 100 different questions spanning the variety of categories like picture and sound challenges, as well as basic level trivia like item pickups and character names. The issue is that on the board, there is one space that fucking sucks to deal with, the grunty space. On it, Gruntilda will ask you one of 30 different trivia questions about herself. In order to find the answers to these questions, you need to speak with Gruntilda, this chick who can be found all throughout Grunty's lair, with each location dealing out three answers. Okay, Sam, that's great and all, but we live in the 21st century and we have computers and can just look up the answers, right? Wrong, because those cheeky fucks at Rareware have randomized the answers unique to every playthrough. So you have to speak with all of the Bruntildas if you want to know all the answers. But unlike a level locale or a piece of music or a cute character design, no normal human being is going to be able to remember and recall 30 separate random facts about Grunty that also change every time they play. You might say, well, Sam, just write them down with the pen and paper as you encounter them, and then you'll feel really rewarded for paying attention and taking detailed notes when you reach the quiz level. I don't want to fucking write! So what this amounts to is you just randomly guessing. You got a 33% chance, so it's definitely doable, but I died from getting bad luck guessing my first run through. The board also has skull spaces that will ask a random question or have you play a random minigame, which answering incorrectly acts as an instant kill. This sounds nerve wracking, but the good news is, is that you can collect tile skips that allow you to skip all skull tiles if you take a specific route. I don't record my live reactions to anything while I'm recording gameplay for reviews, but I was genuinely getting really into Grunty's Furnace Funhouse, yelling out the answers like I'm watching Jeopardy. The one time per episode I know the answer. It's Banjo-Kazooie's big victory lap before wrapping up, and it's a unique highlight that I don't think will ever be replicated. In a way that doesn't suck, ukulele sit the fuck back down. Before rocketing up to the top of the lair, let's get some last minute goodies for being a good little completionist. You're able to get infinite refills on your eggs, red feathers, and gold feathers. You can also use the last of your jiggies for double health, which is pretty neat. Honestly, the difficulty in the Battle of Grunty all depends on if you have the extra health and especially gold feathers. The fight is not necessarily hard or anything, just very long with a bunch of different phases. I think of all the final bosses in 3D platformers, this is probably one of the better ones out there. I know I said earlier when talking about Boss Boom Box that I didn't think Banjo had mechanics fit for a great boss encounter or combat in in general, but to be honest that could be said about most platforming games in either 2D or 3D. After all, games that are primarily focused on jumping around or collecting stuff are too busy worrying about making those objectives as fun as possible and use enemies as an additive to the experience. But when it comes down to having the big showdown, you tend to see platforming games switch it up. For example, in Sonic Adventure, Super Sonic uses a brand new gameplay style for the sake of increasing the spectacle of the final encounter. Even Mario 64, where Mario doesn't necessarily gain any new powers, defeats Bowser by grabbing his tail and spinning him around throwing him into bombs, an action that is performed exclusively during the Bowser encounter. Attacking Grunty evolves the stuff you've been practicing all game. In the first phase, you need to dodge and peck her ass when she's open. The second phase involves you hopping around the perimeter of the roof, shooting eggs at her, very similar to when you shot eggs at Congo all the way back in Mumbo's Mountain. The third phase involves you in an air-to-air -air battle, beak bombing her. And the last part of the fight ends with you shooting eggs and holes like you've been doing the entire game prior. Except this time, you awaken the motherfucking Ginginator, cause it's the 90s and we love Terminator 2, damn it! It's not one of the greatest fights in gaming or anything, but it's a solid, faithful climax to finish up a great game. Benji kazooie has been reaffirmed in my mind as an absolute video game classic. Oftentimes when watching content creators on YouTube who are revisiting games or other pieces of media from their childhoods, usually realize what they liked back in the day was nowhere near as good as what they remembered. That's why I especially enjoyed going back and revisiting Banjo-Kazooie, as it's not often that the stuff from our childhood still holds the test of time, or stands up to our older, more scrutinizing minds. If I had to guess as to why Banjo has lost its clout in the general game's discourse, is because the discussion surrounding how great 3D platformers were has evolved to talking about the 3D platformers that are out now. While I still won't say the genre is officially back in full swing, it's had some notable releases, most recently being Crash 4, which did insanely well as far as sales figures go. But I think there's a lot to be learned from Banjo-Kazooie that I don't see many projects really taking seriously enough. 
Yeah, ukulele is made to take the aesthetics and spirit of Banjo, hell, the game even shares a lot of the core development staff, but the game forgoes doing any of the work Banjo puts in that makes it such an interesting, memorable experience. It's a game that's not iconic because of nostalgia or because it was a right place, right time success story. It's iconic because it tries to be, and not in the way Ubisoft tries to make Aiden Pierce iconic either. There are over 150 music tracks and jingles that play so the music always fits what the player is doing, and it never becomes sonically stale. The levels widely vary both in aesthetics and layouts, making each world feel wholly separate from one another and incredibly timeless. And it brings these worlds to life with charming unique characters along with fun gameplay mechanics. So whether or not you've been a lifelong fan of the Baron Bird or just simply see them as boomer smash characters, the original Banjo-Kazooie is a game that deserves running back to because it's still a classic and one of the best the fifth generation of games has to offer. Thank you so much for watching our video review of Banjo-Kazooie. We know it's a bit different than the content we have been making recently, but if you like the longer form analysis on retro and classic games, make sure to leave this video a like as well as drop a comment to appease the YouTube gods. I've never done a project of this size before, so hopefully the next one will come out much sooner. Until then, please subscribe to Turnstyle for some more equally based gaming content. Take care.